So when you're ready, you can just follow the light and if you would please stop with the light. Straight up the face. Yeah. yeah. So you're talking here. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, we are stuck on 9 degrees. The temperature of the water in a stream is 4 degrees only, which is barely above freezing. You are welcome to dip your hand in, but don't go swimming in it. And for people with good imagination, one elephant is trunk and his body. Water runs over them and they just lose the sparkle. Just keep moving down as those stairs will see that. And formation just fitting up into all these different shapes. Big formation above the walkway is called Queen's Ropes. An estimated weight of that particular formation is in excess of three tons. <laughs> and down in the water, Churchill Sashtray and his cigar. It's a good view of the central plateau. Big area of flat land up. This is the first cascade. This section is called the spout. This is the lower cascade that we climb down and down and down and down to see. Now we've got to go up again. It was a mighty climb out of Liffey Falls. Here we are at a lookout just before we get to the Great Lake. And here we are at 1,209 metres is the Great Lake, right up on the central plateau. It's a big lump of water. We stopped for lunch on the shores of the Great Lake, which would have been great if it hadn't been for the blowflies. Boy, were they thick. It's pretty desolate looking country. It does get snow during the winter, quite a bit of it. it can come up to about uh, a metre deep 
we were told. It doesn't sn stay snowed in for very long. It melts in between falls. We've seen a few sheep grazing, but the housing is mainly holiday homes. It's about an hour and a half from the north coast. Still on the central plateau and going into Interlaken. Quite good farming land in places. And some quite big properties up here. Huge shearing shed there. There's been quite a few cattle as we've come through the last 20 k's. This is an oast house, an old one from about the 1830s, and it was used for drying, drying hops. The hops are grown on strings. They chop the vines off, and then they are laid across bins and the workers pick the flowers off into the bins. The bins are taken in, emptied out on the uh, higher floor onto a drying floor. There's kilns underneath that are run at about uh, 55 degrees centigrade. These dry out the hop flowers for about 12 to 14 hours, then they come down to another floor which is the cooling floor and then they're loaded into presses like a wool press and exported in that form. This is the Mirambina ferry between Bruni Island and the mainland. Pulled out from Kettering and we're heading on the ferry across to Bruni Island. 15 minute trip across. It's a glorious day. The ferry takes 75 vehicles and it's a drive on, drive off. Drive on one end and off the other. Farming trout and salmon on two farms over here. Stop for lunch out at Barnes Bay. Quite a few oysters around the rocks here. And a huge mostly farming land, sheep and cattle. And some lovely old homesteads. This is Great Bay. sort of fish farming going on out there too. This is Adventure Bay. A very narrow neck of land across here. All the great explorers have called in here. Tasman, Cook, Bly, Matthew Flinders. And up the top of this lookout there's a little monument to the Aboriginal people. Roam no more upon this isle, so stay and meditate a while. It's a breeding area for mutton birds and fairy penguins. They can be seen at night coming ashore to their nests. Gee, there's some lovely beaches over here. Called Cloudy Bay. You can see why. Alec reckons it's Cafe Ole. 
You can't work out what's causing the colour. This morning we're cruising up the Derwent to the Cadbury Chocolate Factory. This is the Bowen Bridge ahead of us. Beside us is the Electrolytic Zinc Factory. It employs about 700 people and they bring the zinc down from Broken Hill through the Port Perry Port and process it here. Very necessary for the economy of Tasmania. It's up about 200 acres on the waterfront. This is Hatbury's plant. Beautiful situation. Shopping list consists of matching up the dairy produce, quality and quantity, the uh, deep water port, access to a constant labour force, and the infrastructure to support that labour force, a pleasant environment, as in evidence right there now, and last but not least, a sub-temperate climate. I said sub-temperate climate, I didn't say cold. We're out of Bonnerong Wildlife Park now. It does sure like to. <laughs> oh, look at that baby one! Look at that baby one! There's a baby in its mother's pouch up here. Do you want to go and have a look? They're pretty well fed this lot. for the leftovers. <laughs> spotted quoll. Is there one over there? A much larger, a much more intelligent, a much more efficient hunter. Excuse me, how do yeah. you tell which ones are boy and a girl? Um, the <laughs> only way to really tell is to turn them upside down and see if they have a pouch or not. It's the only, only way to tell. So only the girls have a pouch. I think the girls don't have a no, no, the, the, uh... His eagles have been permanently injured through shooting accidents and they'll never fly again. They're wedge-tail eagles. 80% of their diet is rabbits.
couple of kookaburras. The brush tail possums aren't going to come out for the camera or anything else. As usual, the koalas are asleep. Here's some little wombats. Their mothers were killed on the road. Nine and ten months old and they'll be released into the wild at about 20 months of age. We're at Richmond now. This is the oldest bridge remaining in Australia and behind it the oldest church. There's a lovely old historic bridge at Ross, built by convict labour in 1836 and dedicated to Symbol. Captain Turner, 50th or Queen's Own Regiment Superintendent. The posts and chains leading up to the bridge are still here. Council chambers were built in 1891. The building across the road was built in 1836, the same year as the bridge. Not sure about those houses. The hotel was even a year earlier, 1835. drove all around Ben Lomond this morning and came on up the mountain. I chickened out before the last bit. You can see the road zigzagging up there. And we had lunch. Really not interested in going to the top, but I think Alec's going to go anyway. Lodges up close to the summit. Ski lifts up here in all directions.
back on the north coast again at Port Sorrel. We come in now to the Hellier Gorge. A lovely spot. Various walks around through the bush beside the stream. We had a lovely overnight stop. After breakfast we set off for a walk. There's a waterfall right in the town of Warwick. That may have been used in conjunction with some mining at some stage. There is evidence of ruins here. Out at Ferngrade Reserve again, I finally got to see a platypus. Cheerio, Devonport, beautiful Tasmania. Bye. We have enjoyed your hospitality. Fairly smooth crossing, we're back in Melbourne. Mornington Peninsula at the moment, south of Melbourne. Up a lookout called Arthur's Seat. This is looking further south to the end of the peninsula and the entrance to Port Phillip Bay. Very narrow and a very large bay. Melbourne's down there somewhere. Few high rise through the haze. They have a ferry that goes across the narrow entrance. This is it just coming into Sorrento. Shoreham Beach on the eastern side of the Mornington Peninsula. We're now down on Phillip Island and this is Swan Bay. During the Depression years, chicory was a very big industry on Phillip Island and this is one of the old chicory drying kilns that's still left. And on the rocks is a sinkhole, we call it a forest cave. It does lead through to the sea. And we're coming through into it now.
This place is called Amaze and Things. The words. Oh, what can one say when one's about to be <laughs> put on a blanket? Sit on the chair and marvel as it runs uphill defying gravity. No motors or magnets are used. Drinking room. Walk up the other end. Ooh, didn't he grow? a hectare of gerberas under glass, all controlled by a sophisticated computer system, and each flower is worth $2.07 at the moment. Is the last fatality in this mine was in here. In now, what happened? Mm -hmm. 1969 to 1974, this mine was leased to private enterprise. They'd extract and coal and make briquettes on the surface. There was a miner from a well-known mining family, a man called John Mobilia. They worked at Pizzicunda. He was working in there with his son. He sent his son away to get a couple of skips, and when his son came back, the roof had come in on his father and he lost his life. Now, what John Mobilia done? Every contract miner's done it at one stage of the game or other. I told you they only got paid for the coal they hewed and they'd say to themselves, I can get another skip of coal out of here before I put the timber in. But Mobilia used to go a bit over the top because where the roof came in on him, he was 10 metres or 30 feet in from his timber. And that's just too far. I see a dispute, the horses stayed down. But that never happened on this coal field. The horses went out ahead of every shift. Their harness was taken off, given a warm shout, groomed, put in stables. Looked after to a degree that every pit had a pony paddock. End of the week, Saturday and Sunday, the pit's not working. The horses were turned out to graze, just like an ordinary grazing animal. They worked them hard, they fed them hard. They had a fairly staple diet. They used to get a percentage of oat and chaff, wheat and chaff, and they'd fortify that with a dip of pollen, bran, crushed oats. If you were working a horse underground today, it would cost you $40 a week to feed you. Now, there you there was a coal seam in there and they've taken the coal out. But over a period of 66 years, geological pressure, earth pressure, forces the floor up. The sides crumble in, end of story. And that's how we came back up out of the mine. The step. We stopped for lunch at Fish Creek. I reckon they must have had a flood at some time. Wilson's Promontory National Park now. It's 
is Tidal River, where the camping ground is. We managed to get in because we're interstate visitors. Victorians have to book from one year to the next. And there's a ballot held in July for campsites. We set off on a walk as soon as we'd pulled into the camp. This is around the side of a hill at Tidal River. Overview of Tidal River. Almost back to camp. This is Picnic Bay. Walking in along the Lily Pilly Walk at the moment. Hunting for koalas. We've come off the promontory now and we're at Agnes Falls. Even though it's raining, we're going for a walk this morning along a Lyrebird Ridge track in the Tarabolga National Park. This fellow's enjoying the rain too, just on the track. On the Fern Tree Gully Wharf there's a suspension bridge. Very pretty paths. This is the view from the bridge. There's about 230 varieties of fungi in the park.
time into the Tara Valley. This old Myrtle Beach is about a thousand years old. This is Saitia Falls. This is only about a third of it, but I don't think we can get a good view of the rest. See where the next bit falls over the cliff, but it's very difficult to get it from the bottom. I try. And this is the bottom bit. The middle is very hard to get. These other little ones as well. These are Tara Falls. You can only view them from about halfway down. We come northeast from Sale now, up a very narrow strip of land between the sea and the lakes. And this is Lake Victoria, up almost as far as you can drive at Lock Sport. Nice little posse for lunch. This is the Royal Australian Air Force Base at Sale. The Avenue of Honour and at the gateway an old plane of some kind. Not far out of Stratford, just east of Sale, we stopped at a camping area, a little picnic area. This used to be a dam that was put in in the early days to supply water to the Victorian trains. Of course it's not used for that anymore, but it's a wildlife reserve. We had dinner first and then went to inspect the wildlife as we walked around the little lagoon. We're now in the Mitchell River National Park and there's various walks to go and have a look at things. Nice picnic area. Even wood provided for the barbecue. Mitchell River passes through quite a gorge. favourite course for canoeists. The rapids would provide a bit of a challenge. The stream would be okay. known as the Dean of Nagan. That hole under there. To the side, still forming stalactites. Inside the lake at Painesville. Well, 
lovely beach. This is Lake's entrance. This channel was cut, I think, at the end of last century. Eighteen ninety eight, I think. Just to flush out the lakes area. sculptures along the waterfront. This is Simpson helping his mate to the donkey. stump waiting to be done. Feral another night. Lovely little posse down by the stream. way in now to the Snowy Mountains National Park. And this is Little River Falls. It's the start of a drop of 610 metres over 14 kilometres where it's carved its way through the Great Gorge. This drop is 31 metres. For lunch. Mmm, great for the appetite. This is the start of the gorge from further down. It reaches 500 metres deep in places. Four kilometres long. That waterfall over there comes out of a hidden chasm in the rock wall and drops 300 metres. It's pretty ragged. There are some very strange fish found up in these waters. Three. It's not very deep, but it is very refreshing. This is Malakuta. Eden from the fishing boat harbour. You 
seems to be very much a whale port. Plenty of lovely sea views from around. It's a wood chipping facility across the harbour there. Out on the point, a tower which is a relic of the whaling days. We went through the Whale Museum, which has got some fascinating stories to tell. One about old Tom, an old whale that used to uh, escort them uh, to their, the large whales that they needed to catch in the day, days of the whaling. And also the story of one of the whale men who was uh, swallowed by a whale in 1981, a modern day Jonah. He lived inside for 15 hours and when they processed the whale, he was found unconscious in the stomach. It took him a month to remember what had happened but he lived for another 39 years after, no, another 18 years to the age of 39 after that. His skin was permanently ble bleached by the digestive juices and he lost his hair. Otherwise, he seemed to come through it all right. We stayed a night at Lake Woolagot in Bonda National Park. Facilities were great. There was even showers and flush toilets, washing tubs. Cost us ten dollars for the night. Just a short walk through to the ocean beach. These fellas are checking out whether the campers left any food scraps around. That was a lovely spot to camp for the night. This is the Bega Valley, where Bega cheese comes from. Very productive looking country. That's the Bega Cheese Factory here. Just west of Bemboka we had a mighty climb. The poor old camper was really struggling. Didn't have to get down to first gear but got very close to it. She coughed out a lot of water when we stopped at this lookout too. It was boiling. Actually three lookouts here around a, a little loop walk. This lookout is actually a memorial to a bus driver 
who died near here after shoveling snow off the road. He'd done this route over this hill six days a week for 28 years. And he died age 55 here in 1947. They've done it very nicely for the Alpine Highway along the top goes across a plateau. There are sheep and cattle grazing on it, but it's mostly um, sort of a tussock grass. Look out now above Cooma, which you can see three miles away down there. It's looking out over the plateau. It's up in the snowy mountains. It's the direction of Mount Kosciuszko. That's it in the distance there. It's 48 miles away. That was the heart of the Snowy Mountain Water Scheme. It was started in 1974 and took 25 years to construct. There are seven power stations, 16 major dams and 140 kilometres of tunnels. There's 100,000 workers from more than 30 different countries uh, laboured to set it up. In the centre of town there are the flags flying of all the nations that were represented by the workers. Basically the idea was to take all the water from the snow in the snowy mountains, store it in dams and then use it for hydroelectric generation, pipe it back through the hills into the arid inland. That area now is very productive with um, lots of cropping and orchards whereas before the water was available it was good for nothing. We're just coming into Jindabyne and that's the snowy river there. This is one of the dams, the Jindabyne Dam. The Jindabyne Dam was completed in April 67 and it stores the waters of the snowy Below Island Bend and Eucumbine Dams. It's then pumped into the Trans Mountain Tunnel System for power generation in Murray 1 and Murray 2 power stations. And this is Lake Jindabyne. For memorial to Sir Paul Streslecki on the foreshore of Lake Jindabyne. Sir Paul Streslecki was born in Poland and came out to Australia in 1839. Between then and 1843 he explored and surveyed vast areas of New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. While he was exploring in the Snowy Mountains region, he discovered and climbed Mount Kosciuszko, which he named in honour of the Polish leader. He discovered gold and silver in New South Wales, coal deposits in Tasmania, investigated the possibilities of irrigation, measured the heights of mountains, carried out soil analysis, and collected and identified many fossils and minerals. It was obviously he that the Streslecki track was named after. The Alpine Way at the moment in Kosciuszko National Park, probably about 20 k's from Threadbone. This is the Alpine village of Threadbow. lodges on the hillside. 
and the dreadful scar where it gave way. The Alpine Way above that point is still closed. They're working on it and we have to detour through to Cancoban. red light there. Oh. Oh, I've got somebody giving me hands. <laughs> yeah. so. I'm rather surprised. I'm very surprised. I thought the road was closed. Well, I've closed it further back. It's hard to believe. Well, possibly they didn't have a way around it. Yeah. From there we have 12 kilometres of downhill run. And here we are on Scammell's Ridge at the lookout and looking at Mount Kosciuszko. One. This is Murray 1 power station at Cancoban. The 10 turbine generators can produce enough power for 95 thousand homes at any one time. Water released from Murray 1 power station flows through Murray 2 reservoir before it's used to generate electricity through Murray 2 power station. It's then released into the Swampy Plains River and then into the Murray River for irrigation and river management. We spent the night at a caravan park right beside the lake at Ken Coburn, which of course is another reservoir. This is the dam. Here's Murray 1 penstocks coming down the hills in the distance over there. And this is known as Ken Coburn Pondage, holding back all the gunk there before it flows over the spillway. Obviously very deep, showing about uh, 302.4 metres at the moment. Not much coming through the spillway, but it causes a fair bit of turbulence. This is another one in the scheme. This is the Tuma Reservoir. This one has a tunnel leading out of it into the next part. This is Tumut Pond. This is where that tunnel from the last one discharges into. Don't know how good the fishing is. The waters of the upper Tumut River and diverted waters of the Yukonbeen, Upper Murrumbidgee and Tuma Rivers converge at this pondage. Dam's 280 feet above the riverbed. Then we climbed up above it. It's obviously been a bushfire through here some years ago.
Woomera, the highest town in Australia and the centre of the Snowy Mountain scheme. Doesn't that street design grab you? The Providence portal of the Murrumbidgee Newcombeen Tunnel. It's charging its water into Lake Newcombeen, which is the largest reservoir in the scheme. This is just a very small arm of it. Our overnight camp at Yorongabili. Right beside a nice little stream. This is a poster diagram of where we are at present. Tumut 3 at Talbingo. Shows the lake at the top, the pen stops coming down to the power station. This is Talbingo Reservoir and the spillway the head race channel is 330 feet deep and here we are up at the top of the pen stocks stocks that they can drive a double beat decker bus into. 1.3 million gallons a second. yard coming from the Tumut 2 power station. You hear the sizzling and the huge pylons that take the 330,000 volts or watts volt power away to the old Kyandra gold fields, just a ghost town now. Gold was discovered here in 1859 and within a few months there's about 15,000 prospectors here. When the winter came it was too tough. The government thought they'd all return in the spring and put in permanent buildings but they didn't come and by 61 they hadn't found anything very much, so they all packed up and left. A snow plough sitting beside the road, ready to do service in the winter. This is Blowering Dam and the reservoir. Heading north now, we're at a lookout above Gundagai. The Murrumbidgee River flows through it, which they're obviously catering for with these big long bridges when it floods. And to say you couldn't come anywhere within Kiri of Gundagai without having a look at the dog on the tucker box, now could you? Now 
They really do have to make some mileage out of it. Well, we came to Cootamundra to see the wattles. Not that they're in flower at the moment, of course. This was an unexpected bonus. This is Bradman's birthplace, 89 Adams Street. This is the kitchen of the small cottage where he was born. It used to be a small hospital. I've just done, um, well, in, yeah. immobilised her enough. Entrance into Canberra from either Sydney or Melbourne. Day 99. Ensley. You can see Canberra spread out below. War Memorial in the foreground with the Avenue of Honour. Old Parliament House is the white one on the other side of the lake. And the new Parliament House behind it on Capitol Hill. The fountain is playing again. And there's the Telstra Tower with the revolving restaurant. Commercial sector. Amazing the way the residential area is hidden. You're not aware of houses as you drive around the streets because of the tall trees. They're so close to the Civic Centre. Garden at the National Gallery at the moment. Course it's on tight. He? I think it's a she. Yeah, it could be a she. She wants a pea too, obviously. <laughs> this one looks like a bridge that somebody's cut off from halfway. God, wonder how much they paid for that. P, that's a Veronica. The red colouring is caused by crushed brick. It is supposed to represent the sands of the desert, the hebe bush and the sand dunes, the blue gums along either side of the mountain ranges around the edge of the desert. Inside of the roll of honour. On the eternal plane. Inside that door is the tomb of the unknown soldier. Beautiful marble inside the main foyer. Lots of these wood inlays all the way around the Great Hall. A cockatoo and the Halley's Comet. And floor up. Three thousand odd paintings around the building. Us today for uh, Jim Cope, former Speaker of the House of Representatives. The 
heading up to the revolving restaurant for dinner tonight on the Telstra Tower. It's up on top of Black Mountain which is 812 metres. Here's the external scene changing, so is the internal one. main building. This is the village in miniature. Actually, actually a replica of Cockington near Torquay in Devon. Thirteen and a half thousand bricks and tiles laid in this construction. This is Lavenham in Suffolk, famous for its leaning and pink painted buildings. This is Boss Castle, small village on the north coast of Cornwall. Fitzwilliam Arms Hotel in Cambridgeshire. This is a brick and flint period house with Queen Anne facade built in 1676 in Sussex. <coughs> These little farms are so authentic they're just like we saw in England.
This is Braemar Castle. Braemar is in the Scottish Highlands and it was built in 1628. Even a soccer game in progress. Must have been playing Wales. God Manchester, situated near the Great Ouse River in Huntington. This is Willie Lott's cottage from Constable's painting The Hay Wayne. Fairy Yidden in Norfolk. Duxford Mill. Stonehenge. There's a turf maze. The horse-drawn canal boat. Oh, about to go through the lock. One in the lock. This is called the House in the Clouds. It's in Suffolk. It was originally a water tower built in 1923, but after criticism, the bottom was blocked in to provide accommodation and the top part conceals the water tank. The windmill pumps water to the House in the Clouds. Kite flying. Don't think the hunt's going very well. Through under the bridge they've started another display, Australian and International. This is a South African building, Dutch influence to the architecture. This is going to be a food and service centre. This one, the Central Deborah Mine at Bendigo. This is going to be the site of the German castle. A very pretty one with the unpronounceable name. Uh, Chile. Marketplace in Colombia. Doesn't it do your heart good? <laughs> Do anything for a feed, I will. Yeah. Yeah, it's a walk in Avery.
We've come about 50 k's outside Canberra at the moment to come out and have a look at the deep space tracking station. little antennae in all directions. Sample of moon rock. By the time we came out, the big one was at a completely different angle to what it was when we went in. So obviously, the Voyager that it's tracking is still moving. On the way back to Canberra, we stopped at the Gibraltar Falls. I can't get far enough back to the extent of them. Today we're doing a beach crawl up the south coast of New South Wales. This is Mary Beach. dolphins out there. Murray's Beach on Jervis Bay. This is the Shoalhaven Heads. Little blow street of Kayama. Oh, 
foreground doesn't do much for it, but this is a Buddhist temple near Port Kembla. tell us that a compassionate mind can make all evil spirits yield. A kind mind can be free from all the wicked ones. A happy mind can accomplish all wishes and a generous mind can attain all prosperity. New Year lights offering celebration. Everyone is compassionate. All places are auspicious for auspicious to all. Close very industrial. Everybody's sitting. What's going on? What the hell's going on? Right, I guess. Front of Wollongong. These gun placements were set up in 1893 to guard Wollongong against possible Russian attack. Two out of the three guns are still in place, but they were never fired in anger. The ammunition rooms are buried. Another one over there. This is looking south, and we're about 30 k's south of Sydney at the moment on the Ocean Road. Stanwell Park, just before we go into Royal National Park. Got the hang gliders here having some fun. Yeah. We spent a night in Royal National Park just south of Sydney, which the ranger tried to tell us was booked out. It cost us $19 for the night. It was a hot shower. About a kilometre and a half away. Definitely no power, not much else. We came on to Sydney and we found a caravan park on the shores of Botany Bay. The heads out there. And coming around towards Sydney. A ticket this morning has taken us on the bus as far as the station. We're riding around in the trains for most of the day to the markets and back. We're now down at Circular Quay and still our $1 will take us on the ferry up the river to Parramatta. Long that we 
a mechanical problem getting close to Parramatta so we all had to offload and wait for the next one to take us the rest of the way. Our ill-fated one headed on back to town. Killed pretty much a city of high-rise skyscrapers. The odd old one still remaining hasn't been knocked down yet. It's an exercise in contrast. The old and the new. You can see things all being put in by concrete to blame that. going under the Sydney Harbour. Up until we nosed into it, we didn't know whether we were heading for the bridge or the tunnel. Well, maybe we weren't. Now we are. <laughs> We don't know where we're going, neither do we. Heading up to Gosford, you go through some fairly rugged sort of country. There's um, some great cuttings have been put in and uh, this is what they call the Twin Bridges. Gosford, from a lookout above it. We need to cross the Hawkesbury River here. And the only way across is with Wiseman's Ferry. The other side there was a lovely picnic ground where we had our lunch. Up in the hills you can just see the ferry disappearing behind the trees there. Just across the road from the caravan park is one of the lookouts down into the valley. That's the three sisters there. Beside us, the Katoomba Falls. They'll be floodlit at night. We'll bring it closer. Okay. Yeah. These are Witch's Leap Falls. Cascades at the very top of the Katuma Falls. And right at the very top. Not that you can see very much of the way down. 
and we're definitely up in the clouds. fence around this tree stump were erected in 1884 by government officials was to protect a tree that was marked by the three explorers who found the way over the Blue Mountains in 1813. The explorers were Blacksland, Lawson and Wentworth. In the area up behind the tree, there are 20 piles of stones which mark the graves of convicts that died while the road was being put in, which is only three k's away from the timber. Lure of the stage. It is on and on, sort of gradually down the slope. Very pretty walk. Central buildings have been very well done. Huge overhanging rock here, the picnic tables and the barbecue. Like most of the area, in need of some maintenance. Nice little pool for a swim nearby. From this lookout, we're on the other side of the Three Sisters. the Gordon Falls. A little waterfall across there too. And at the Wentworth Falls lookout. Just go on and on and on. Right down in the valley. We're approaching Denolan Caves at the moment. Roadway goes right through that hole. This bridge was built a long time ago. The tops are interlocking blocks. Inside the Grand Archway, 
was originally used about the 1800s for dances and concerts and musical events. There's a lot of caves that open into this archway. Colour in the water there is caused by the minerals, absolute mineral water. They say it's very sweet and it's what they use for drinking here. The first part of the tour of the Orient Cave is a 400 foot long man made tunnel. Two chambers by the growth of the formation. James Wybert, it was called the Dome of St Paul. These days it's known as the mosque because we've got a little monk sitting outside the mosque. In the middle of the Egyptian drapes, we've done something different. We've hung a blanket. So if you want to go on another tour, we don't do it every day, it's a very small cave, we like to give it a rest, we don't like to flog it to death. So it's only this is the Katoomba Falls flood lock at night. This is the Three Sisters Fountain up at the Skyway office. is the Gross Valley. It's uh, a different hole from the one that you see from Katoomba. This is uh, a little further north. Another one, this is Perry's Look Down. Next adventure is a trip on the steam train up and down the zigzag railway. Go to the other end of the train at this point. Oh, 
reduced to little levels. Obviously, we have 500 gallons on the way out of the Through a little place called Grenfell, we came across an obelisk marking the birthplace place of Henry Lawson. This is an extract from his autobiography. I had a dreamy recollection of the place as a hut. Some of my people said it was a tent on a good frame, for father was a carpenter. The tent was the same that I was born in on the Grenfell Goldfield some three years before. I was born in 1867 and died in 1922. A tree was planted by his daughter two years after he died. Travel today through West Wyalong, May, Balrenal. It's pretty bare. We then went up to look at Seaton's farm, which they lived and worked at for 35 years and only left in the 1960s. It's unbelievable that people lived in these conditions. It's as late as that. This is the house, the veranda there with the grapevine over it and the main part of the house there. This is the kitchen, the fireplace. You can see the mud-lined walls. They cut down the timber from the farm to make the framework. But with the mud that they dug out of the, or hand dug out of the dam. This is the corner of the bedroom. All the chook houses. The place has now been taken over by the National Trust and they're going to restore it to a certain extent. Jim Seaton never threw anything away and this is his storeroom. All good stuff. Might come in handy one day. We went for a walk up into the hills behind the uh, camping area to a cave that was used by Ben Hall, one of the notorious bush rangers in the 1860s. This is one of a number of caves that he used while he was staging his raids on travellers and stagecoaches and gold escorts. Doesn't say what actually happened to him but there were various ones in the gang and they were all either hanged or jailed or exported. Alec reckons exporting them makes them seem like a commodity but they were a dime a dozen in those days. in again. After the lock is filled, 
the upstream gates will open. The junction of the Darling River on the left and the Murray shows the different colours of the two rivers. Murray looks dirty until you see the Darling alongside it. Drove through to the Barossa Valley and although it was too late for a tour, we tasted some wines at the Yalumba Winery. Feature a cooking school. They do the places up beautifully, the Barossa Valley from Mingler's Hill. The tribute to the early pioneers. The 1840s Barossa was settled by scattered British families, but they were followed from 1842. From Barossa we travelled north through some very dry wheat country. Into the Clare Valley. Lots of wineries there too. Up to Port Augusta. Now this is a mistletoe in flower, something that I haven't seen before. And they're all in flower as we come across through the barren country between Iron Knob and Kimber. Back at Nullarbor service station again. Out night out in the wild was at a rest area um, just about 40 k's west of Kaiguna. Barbecues, tables, tank water, and the toilet. Actually the same place that Trina and I stayed on our way across, only then the area underneath the shelter was fully taken up and we stayed out in the bush over there. On the back road from Balladonia down to Esperance and there's a wild camel on the road in front of us. Losing. Yeah, look at that. It's too far away. Ah, is it? Yeah. I need to get up closer. 